Um, but the, the focus really um, is on academic development. Um, and this is a term that has, it's a very woolly term that even people working within academic development won't be drawn on defining it because it's a slippery concept that I think um, people who work in it generally work in roles within, I'm talking about the UK context here, tend to work within uh, institutions and have an institutional remit, which is supporting uh, academic staff within the institution in their professional development and also to, um, to support teaching and learning within an institution. These are the dominant foci, although sometimes research is considered within its ambit as well. But generally, it's about supporting teaching and learning and supporting professional staff. Um, and that's how it manifests in the UK. It's very similar in Australia and in the States. And these are the uh, domains from which the, the, the field, if you like, and certainly the, under, this, um, under this term, has emerged. And so what comes with that, of course, are a whole raft of assumptions about what institutions are like, how they're governed, how they're structured, how people work within them, and so on. And the curricula that have developed, that academic development is typically delivered through programs, CPD programs, or sometimes through at our university we have a PGCHE, which is for probationary staff who come onto the course and who, who start at the university and they have to undertake this as part of their probation. So it's a kind of... Um, training program within an, the framework of an academic uh, course. Um, but yeah, it, it tends to be structured in this way and, it's, and, and um, the assumptions embedded within that are that universities operate in a particular way. Um, so that's, and, and I work in academic development. My teaching responsibilities at Kent are teaching on a, on a program of that kind. So that, that, that's, that's the, uh, the kind of... Um, theoretical area that it's coming from. Um, how do I, oh sorry, I'm using my laptop to try and change the slides then, it's not going to work, is it? Um, but yeah, so, so from, just to give you a bit of a, a preamble into how I got involved in CARA and how this made me rethink and uh, challenge those assumptions that I had uh, imbibed about what uh, academic development was, um, an email came round to my boss. Um, which was from uh, the Council for At-Risk Academics who run a program to support Syrian academics who are in exile in Turkey, uh, Lebanon and Jordan, so uh, neighbouring countries of Syria. Um, and my boss had sent me this email because my work, some of my prior research and ongoing research is focuses on Turkey. So I think she just sent this to me as opposed to someone else on that basis. So it was a kind of chance encounter really. And then I went to a meeting and they asked me if I wanted to come along to deliver academic development support for a group of Syrian academics in exile in Turkey. I knew nothing about the group. I knew nothing about Syria really um, beyond what little we hear these days in the news and it seems to have dropped off the news, we hear very little about what's going on. And I went um, along with colleagues from other universities and we, we um, didn't really know what to expect. And when we got there, realised we were completely out of our depth and all of these assumptions that we had about what academic development was and where its value uh, lay and uh, how it should be delivered and what the uh, recipients of this, if you can call them recipients, what, what the participants of our academic program might want and need and experience. We knew nothing about this and this was a huge wake up call and I was, uh, um, and that started me thinking, hang on a minute, we need to think about what academic m development is, should be, could be, and certainly what it needs to be for this um, population that we're working with. So that's where the kind of, so it started from, not from a research agenda, I should say. So this, this was really about um, a, a, a practice agenda of delivering a program. Um, that was three years ago now, and, and over the course of the last three years, we've interrogated this idea and, and working with uh, Syrian colleagues have started to, uh, I, I hope and I, and I think, uh, develop an understanding really from building up from the bottom again about what this needs to mean in this concept, in this context. And I'm not even sure really if academic development is an appropriate label to, uh, to apply to this anymore. However, it has currency when um, discussing this in the round with people from other uh, contexts. Um, so that's really how this, has, this uh, project has coalesced around that theme. 
clicker. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> done it again. Um, just to give you a bit of background about, about CARA, um, yeah, it's an acronym, but although they've moved it into lowercase now, so it looks like a person's name, which is always complicated in emails when you receive an email from CARA and no one knows who she is, but it's, um, it's the Council for At-Risk Academics, um, and it's been supporting academics at risk since, since the 30s. It, it, initially, it, start, it was UK-based, and it was initially, its, it's earlier work was principally around bringing Jewish refugees from Central Europe and giving them uh, positions in UK universities. Um, but this has carried on uh, since then. Um, and the, the bulk of their work still works on that basis. So it's on, based on individual fellowships or um, visiting professorships for academics from contexts, um, from at-risk contexts, and at-risk defined quite broadly. So it might be political persecution, it might be conflict or other factors. Um, to come to uh, UK universities, or now not necessarily just UK universities, but s universities in, in uh, safe countries. And um, in the UK, CARA receives funding from uh, the Scholars at Risk UK network of 117 universities. This uh, at Kent is completely under the radar, and I didn't realise that Kent is a subscribing institution to this, but um, because I think, and I think this is common to a lot of universities, I don't know how prominent this is, uh, this is here, but um, it's not. It's not. There's there's very little visibility around this. The fact that there, this network exists, and I think if there was more visibility, um, a lot more could be achieved. There's a payroll giving scheme that we have, so your academics and employees at Kent are invited to um, donate from their pay to it, and the university provides in kind support for uh, workshops and resources and things like that. But it's it's not. Um, it, could, it needs reinvigorating, I think, certainly at Kent, because I think a lot more could be achieved in that regard. Um, and uh, CARA operates under conditions of explicit neutrality, and this allows it to operate in uh, certain contexts, which is an advantage from the point of view of being able to broker things, but it also um, means that it also, it's also very limiting in other ways, in that um, certainly when... Uh, Participants' expectations of what CARA can achieve for them or might want to do don't square up with CARA's necessary position of neutrality. And this is, uh, and maybe as I go on to talk more about this, this will become more clear. It sounds a bit abstract in that in that way. Um, but anyway, th this is the bulk of their work. The Syria program is different. It's funded by an external funder, um, and it's. Uh, the scale of uh, applicants to CARA from the Syrian context were there were so many Syrian academics seeking uh, CARA support that it, this was not a f feasible model. And um, as had happened previously in Iraq, um, the, the, uh, instead in-region support was uh, a program of in-region support was formulated, and that's why this is based in Turkey, which of Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan is the easiest country to um, operate in. Although not necessarily, um, there are complications for how participants are able to um, access the provision over there, which I'll, I'll come to as well. But anyway, um, please do ask me any questions about this. I've, I've only given a whistle-stop um, explanation about this, and indeed interject at any, any point. Um, Can I just ask one question? Yes, go for it. Yeah. Uh, are there any circumstances under which <coughs> Kyle would not support someone who claims to be an academic? This is someone who claims to be an academic at risk, did yeah. you say? Yeah. I'm, I don't... I know how that would play out in terms of the actual application process because I'm very distanced from that in, to some extent in this, this, working on the program that we're on we, it's, we only meet people at the point at which they are already on the program but no, I, and that's a very interesting question, I don't know how um, but The reason I ask is because the, there was quite a lot of controversy some years ago around the Red Cross the International Red Cross is it mm -hmm. a Yeah Yes, mm -hmm. that's definitely a, um, a, a, a possible corollary of this mm -hmm. neutral position. Definitely, I think it needs to be. Yeah, and that's something I, I, I need to do more thinking about. I think um, 
Yeah, and I, I think as far as I know, car, there are, there is, there's an American institution, I can't quite remember their name, who operates in a similar way to uh, CARA. Their, their, their criteria for, their, for acceptance are that you have to have a PhD, you have to have held a position within a university, and uh, uh, in terms of cl classifying someone as an academic, sorry, <laughs> and, and I'm not sure how they gauge whether the claim to being at risk is um, so much. I think CARA does it more on a kind of um, good faith basis, that if people claim they are, then it's, then it's considered that to be the case. And also that there's no requirement for a kind of um, threshold qualification in CARA. I think you just have to have had a position in um, a university. And this has actually become very important on the programme because the nature of convict is that so many doctoral students had their studies um, terminated or had to abandon their studies um, and, and, and yet uh, perceive themselves to be on an academic trajectory. They self-identify as academics. So there are, it, it, it's more inclusive in that respect, I think. And the other um, thing is that, um, as it, with many countries around the world, um, there are academics who don't have PhDs. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and it's and, and I think that's an unfortunate um, criterion for, for that other scheme actually, yeah. because of the because precisely that reason. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, yeah. So the um, I'll skip over this. I might come back to that. Sorry. Um, yeah, just to give some context about about Syria and um, what's happened to higher education in Syria. Um, the, um, the the sector has been uh, decimated. There is a, a functioning higher education um, uh, system in Syria within the regime areas, regime controlled areas, and, and um, a recent paper by Samson actually challenged the received wisdom that there is no functioning higher education inside Syria. And said, so, well, actually, no, there is um, quite an established and functioning. Uh, higher education system in Syria it's generally within regime areas and actually at, at the British Council last year I went to a, a talk where some Syrian academics from Damascus University had come to the UK and were um, touring various universities trying to build bilateral uh, agreements with them and the thing that was most striking about it was there was no evidence of any conflict in the slide uh, show that they presented, and 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 there was no um, sense that there was any that what was happening in the non-regime controlled areas in the north uh, were as they were, and what was even more striking was the willingness of um, the UK attendees from various universities to to just uncritically say, yeah, let's do it, let's um, let's build a working relationship, and and then um, and, and so on. Um, and, uh, but the bulk of those, because of the, the bulk of those on, on the Syria program are, are, are from non-regime areas and, and are based in Turkey, where um, and the higher education sector has been decimated. So there are the infrastructure has been damaged. Buildings have this is an uh, explosion at Aleppo University. But there are very you know the, the um, in the halls of residence I think that was, um, the, 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 and but also the the the, the um, archives have gone. Uh, systems have gone, um, so there's very little binding. Uh, there's, there's there's no kind of institutional uh, binding agent, if you like, for these communities who've been dispersed. And um, in Turkey, the when they are uh, uh, where the bulk of those who we work with are in Turkey, they're domiciled in different regions. So um, though there are some some cities where there are high numbers of Syrian academics, so they are able to kind of form, form uh, mutual support groups and things like that. Some are dispersed to quite far cities um, and where they might be on their own or um, w with very little connection. And one of the conditions of the temporary t protection status they have is that there are limits on being able to travel within the country. So sometimes they are they're very much isolated. Um, Again, thank you. I will. I'll get this. I reckon about ten slides in, I'll get it, and then I'll be finished. Um, yeah, and one of the things that um, 
I should say here that in, in the way we've, we've been working with, uh, as I said at the beginning, we, we didn't know what academic development had to mean in this context. And so our starting point from that was really to, uh, to ask our colleagues what, what their priorities were, what they felt they needed, uh, what they, where they saw, how they saw their um, academic trajectories or professional trajectories and future and circumstances and what support they felt that we could give them or wanted from us to do that. So the agenda has started with a kind of uh, a needs analysis, if you like. And one of the main anxieties that expressed to us was that having been out of higher education for a number of years, they felt they were de-skilling. They, they weren't teaching in classrooms. Um, they weren't undertaking research. And um, they were concerned not only for their own professional capacity, but also for the implications for this for Syria's intellectual capital and, and heritage. That they, that as the bearers of this knowledge, that there was a there was a critical risk of this being lost. Um, so, so, so that's just the, the context, um, really, of of of, uh, of what's happened. And yeah, so after this needs analysis, and we we did a kind of uh, participant-led agenda setting. Um, over a course of a number of workshops and the delivery strands that came out of that is, well, the first was English for academic purposes this was the thing that was seen by uh, that was called for the most was support in learning English um, and so the um, BALIAP which is the I don't know what the acronym stands for but it's an English for academic purposes um, network international network a call was put out for that and one-to-one -one, uh, English language lessons were, um, were uh, participants were paired up with an English language teacher for one-to-one -one lessons and that's in dispute with workshops and then the academic development strand which was originally called academic skills development and we whipped that away now um, was uh, in response to the wanting to initially this was responding to desire for te um, de uh, training in modern teaching methods is what they said because they um, there there is in in Syria it was a very much um, a didactic model talk and talk huge cohorts and so they wanted to um, have and this came from some of those who are teaching in Turkish universities, I think, felt that they needed training in this this, this type of um, uh, teaching, and also res a res a two research schemes to support projects, um, and there's a funding scheme to support small research projects, um, with um, uh, usually with groups of Syrians and in some cases individuals to undertake research. So there's some funding to. Um, for primary research costs, field work costs, transcription, that kind of thing. Um, anyway, that, that's very much focused on the, uh, the skills side of things. And, and, but what also emerged was that um, there, was a, there was a sense to which there was an effective aspect of all this that wasn't being addressed by our program and couldn't necessarily be addressed by us. There was a, the emotional consequences and the trauma associated with being a displaced academic was an ever-present factor on the program, but something that we as UK-based volunteers were, were ill-equipped to provide meaningful support in that context. Um, and so um, some, and in, in some of our Syrian colleagues said to us, we, we need to speak to people from other who've gone through similar um, crises, um, who have experienced um, trying to sustain academic activity under, context, uh, under circumstances of conflict, or who have come out of the other side of that, or are in a post-conflict setting where, um, which might give them some insight of what what, what the future might hold and so it's been something that we'd, we'd wanted to, to do for a while was to bring in colleagues from international contexts um, I won't say comparable because what, one thing that came out of the workshop was that there, was the, you, there, there are the, the unique contingencies of each case were very was, were, made the, the, there were there was certainly potential for transferable uh, there was there was a lot of empathy, but insight and but you couldn't 
it was very difficult to make immediate comparisons or to provide advice in a particular way because the contexts were inevitably so complex, super complex contexts that couldn't be reduced to a model. And that was one of the things that came out of it. But nonetheless, we, we, this was what, what we wanted to, uh, to do. So we managed... Just to say, so, yes. it's lovely to see the, the arrows in, you know, kind of in these reciprocal directions because I think that's unfortunately what we're seeing with a lot of the brain drain activity now is higher ed here saying, yeah, we provide scholarships for academics to come here. Totally. But it's, it's, it's to actually extract, again, yet again, <laughs> from the Global South, right? So Absolutely. So we enhance our own positioning. And it's rather than this two-way yeah, and we wanted to, to yeah, to emphasise that um, reciprocity, actually. And, and I think it, when we were writing up, actually, um, we, we were... Um, Dina and I wrote up a short, uh, written up a short piece about the workshop we did, and I'd, in, when I was writing it, I'd been uh, referring to the attendees as participants, and I think that the nuance of calling them contributors was important in that regard. Actually, it was a totally reciprocal domain, and that was needed to be brought to, to, to the fore. Um, anyway, we um, we managed to get some funding to to to, to convene a, a, a round table and we're able to invite um, partners from uh, universities from a various, various uh, international universities. So we had um, people from uh, Bosnia, uh, 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 participants from Bosnia, Herzegovina, Serbia, South Africa, uh, Belarus, Palestine, um, Syria, obviously. Kenya. Sorry? Kenya. Kenya. And um, yeah, so and, and also representatives from NGOs and UN agencies who came to the second two days to um, participate in a in a in a an ongoing discussion about how the international community might um, play a role in supporting Syrian higher education. But the first two days were really just about sharing, and we tried to have a very loose, inductive agenda that wouldn't hem us into certain lines of discussion. And it was that we wanted to have something that would be uh, organic and see where it went, really. And um, yeah, so the aims that we set out were to <coughs> build connections between Syrian and global higher education, to draw international attention to the experiences of Syrian academic communities in exile and inside Syria. Uh, to generate comparative insight concerning higher education and conflict, um, to promote knowledge and resource share in relation to academic development in, con in conflict context. And resource share, really, this, this, on a very pragmatic level, this is because so, much, so many academic resources are paywalled and are and inaccessible. And, and almost, you know, and, and it's, uh, the literature is predominantly anglophone and so this is about finding ways to uh, work around this and provide mechanisms for resource share that for people who don't have institutional affiliation and don't have access to this kind of resources um, yeah and also to, to increase the presence of Syrian voices within international fora there, th th this was um, th there's a palpable sense of frustration and dismay among uh, Syrian colleagues that they're just not listened to and they don't have opportunities to, to, to uh, express their uh, um, feelings and, and situation and to, uh, and to, 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 to uh, converse with international counterparts. So that was a, 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 a major um, aim. Um, anyway, we'll carry on. That. Yeah, so it took, it took uh, we had this very hot room uh, with simultaneous translation for a couple of days. Um, and it was, um, the time went very quickly, and, um, but it was very challenging discussions at times. Um, the insights that uh, this is, we, yeah, we, we structured this really around a round table event, but also as themes emerged, we uh, set up some working groups to explore those in, in depth and drill down with those and then share them outwardly again and uh, bring them back into the round. Um, yeah, so I'll take you through these. There we go. <laughs> um, and some of the things that emerged from this that I think maybe will, will help us in this discussion. Um, 
the first one was, was it possible or desirable to depoliticize higher education? Um, and this, uh, I think it, this uh, opinion on this seemed to sift out into two camps, and those, that, and that was the Syrians who were in a conditions of present crisis. They felt that in order to make higher education functional in that context, you had to depoliticize it, and it had to be purely instrumentalist and have a, a skills-based agenda, and that politics and sectarian concerns and all the rest should be left at the door, and, and, and there would be a kind of a commitment to this shared neutral space. Those in po post-conflict context said, that's not going to work. It's inherently and uh, fundamentally politicized. To depoliticize it is an absolutely political act, and you need to reckon with this at the time, and, and so on. So there was this. And, and, yeah. and oh, sorry, and then not just all of us in post-conflict, even though there was a definite sort of, also some of those who are in, in strange situations, like in Palestine and, and the um, university in exile too. Mm -hmm. There was a sense yeah. there that um, higher education is also about resistance. Um, yeah. And so it cannot not be. So, that, But it was very interesting to see how, in that case, there really was a, a, a strong sense of split, as you say. Yeah. Um, and we kept on returning to this question. Um, yeah, definitely. And it, yeah, that was unresolved as well. We, yeah. There was, yeah, it's... Uh, loomed over all the discussions actually this because it ultimately everything came back to decision making and 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 and, uh, and, and that um, the other thing that emerged was people reminded us that academia can be complicit in conflict um, there was a often the discussions took this um, the, the assumption in the discussions was that higher education was something fundamentally and intrinsically good that needed to be protected in a com context of conflict and that academ academics were, um, were also, by association, fundamentally good and, uh, and would play a role in making things better. And we were reminded that actually, and, and in the Syrian case, our colleagues reminded us that no, that you know, higher education can be, is complicit in conflict. Uh, it's um, it, institutions particularly are, um, and, and the populations within institutions can be um, aggressive towards other institutions. And there was, within the current landscape of Syria, that seemed to be the case. Um, and the a kind of pathological understanding of conflict uh, would impede progress and uh, reconciliation. This idea that conflict was an undesirable um, um, pathology that needed to be uh, solved rather than, uh, um, what, what might we say, uh, a necessary process to, to, to resolve a deeper pathology. Um, Again, the, the, this was um, there was no consensus around any of these things. It was, um, but there, in some cases, there were definite camps that felt yeah. one thing or the other. Can I add the one yeah. on academia being complicit? There were these moments, really poignant moments, which were very interesting for those of us who came from very different contexts. Particularly, there was a person from Serbia and then Kosovo and myself. We, we literally were burdened by emotion when we started talking about. Um, academics who had returned from exile to our countries and the play between academics of those who had been, who had supported reg regimes, those who had fought against them, um, those who had been n neutral in, in a state where they should have spoken against um, and just that sense of what is academic voice about if it isn't about resistance to oppression. But we literally were we were at times sort of burdened by emotion, trying to talk about it and and frame that sense of our, our institutions are, um, all three of us I think had that really so sense of the toxicity within the institutions was partly because it hadn't been dealt with, mm. this, in, this idea of academia being complicit. So we were trying to almost forewarn them of things to come, which is very difficult to do, um, yeah. but yeah. <coughs> just a um, slightly different context. One of the universities we collaborate with, which is where the Office for Higher Education Services is in Ethiopia, is at McKelly University. 
Now, as you know, there have been a lot of political changes in Ethiopia recently. So, three years ago, Mekele was a hub for funding because that's where the then Prime Minister came from. So funds poured into the into Tigray region in Ethiopia. And now there's been a change of government. That funding's been frozen. So all the projects that were starting at a complete standstill, you've got all these cranes and everything else just at a complete standstill. Okay. Moving elsewhere. And so it is really very difficult to depoliticize higher education. I'll give you another example from my home country, from Uganda, where, well, let's start with wherever we are speaking from. Higher education is often led by minister, right? As a political appointee. They have their job to save. When it comes to a country like Uganda, it's even more ridiculous because the Minister of Education is a fast lady. So higher education institutions see themselves as almost the voice of dissent. They're totally dismissive of everything that's government initiated. And the tension means the way forward is as complicated mm. as it gets. And I just thought of no, it's really interesting. No, yeah. I just thought I'd follow that. Absolutely, there. it's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. There was a um, uh, the con what the Concord what was what there was a large statement made literally while we were in the same days while we were oh, in this yes. round table um, with the uh, you know the Syrian academic saying where is the supposed protection for people like us there's all these NGOs looking around at education and students, but where is it really for academics while we were having these discussions there was that sta yeah. statement made. Yeah, it was the um, it was the European. Um, oh, what was it? Uh, but yes. about academic, academic freedom, freedom. Um, institutional autonomy. It was this large, you know, sort of, um, which was just such an irony because you had these people literally saying, "We've been asking this for years, and, and where is that sense of solidarity from academic counterparts or institutional counterparts across the world?" Um, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, there was um, on the on the point of being in exile. There was a, um, th again th th this was um, it, uh, colleagues from uh, Serbia and um, Bosnia spoke of actually in in the con when you're away from the setting of a conflict in a in a different space then commonality was just on, on an effective level was brought to the fore and they were able to have discussions that elsewhere they weren't able to have mm -hmm. and that, and then i think everybody in the in the room agreed with that and the fact that being in exile often is a is um that uh, uh, configures one's thinking to a more uh um reconciliatory mode and uh rather than um, and this was the case across uh, ethnic divisions and uh, political divisions and so on. Um, how that then um, moves on from that was, was, was again unresolved, but there was a sense that this was valuable in and of itself for that reason only. Um, on the point of resources, every, there were a huge amount of resources were identified and people immediately said, oh, well, we have access to these resources, we could share it, uh, you know, we could share these with you and vice versa. But um, these are often things that aren't uh, available through, um, through search engines or things like that. So there are a lot of local resources that have been drawn up and so finding a way of um, creating a, a a repository of some kind to, to, to facilitate sharing was something that somebody wanted to take forward. Um, and yeah, there was just a, a huge desire to build international support networks among those there from these contexts, um, even if the, uh, the, the differences between these uh, contextual experiences were so profound, there was a, a sense that mutual support on an effective level was incredibly powerful and, and, and important. And it didn't necessarily point towards any specific strategies. There was very little strategy emerged from this in terms of um, how the Syrian academics, because although this was an international exchange, there was a, at its core was this uh, concern for how 
Syrian academics in exile could sustain an academic community. Um, and there were very little sort of uh, directive strategies that you should try this, you should try that. Um, but there was a more a, a softer sense in that, that solidarity would help and support those efforts, whatever they might be. Um, some colleagues said they were concerned that actually when uh, international brokering or international partners retreat from a situation that the um, the that there was a, this is about working across divisions and um, Syrian academics from different um, who, who might have different polit political persuasions or from different regions or different ethnic groups um, were able to work together within in contexts where there was uh, a foreign um, component facilitating dialogue, but then they said often that this was that they were unable to do it themselves. They felt, and when when there was no foreign involvement, um, that they were unable to sustain this in the long term, and that they needed um, training in uh, brokering amongst themselves and in working relationally and, and collaboratively. Um, also, it's worth saying that Syrian higher education was very, um, there was, there's, there, it was a very teaching focused system and, there, and um, any research that was undertaken was expected to be done in one's own time and there was no institutional provision for research time, things like that. So it was a solitary endeavor that you did on your own um, usually desk-based type research. And so the idea of collaborating on research projects is not uh, embedded in that academic culture. And um, undertaking collaborative projects and experiences, there is a, um, a suspicion and a comp competition within those settings that un sometimes undermines collaborative endeavor. And that was something that they've, uh, that, that, that the Syrians themselves said we need to, um, be able to develop skills of collaborating within ourselves if we're going to achieve things collectively. Um, one of the one of yeah. the things that that came out, which I thought was quite interesting too, was that there is a lot of research being done across Syria, and um, particularly in the freed areas, um, that research is being done by outside agents. And there was a sense of why you know why are we not, as those who know the context well part of those processes or consulted or included or positioned in a way that we can do that. It's a really interesting um, dilemma um, and I think, I think they're right to have a sense of, we feel a strong sense of responsibility to that place, it is our place, why are we not within that? So as much as there may not have been a, a strong tradition of that before, there is a real desire to, to be working and, and helping address those problems. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's the that was the uh, uh, a summary of our of our um, round table. But do please ask me any questions either now or at the end if um, if you have any.